Hello to everyone who is joining our webinar today, The What's and Whys of IT Asset Management. Uh, my name is Ron Fagan. I am the General Manager of APMG US International. Um, actually, APMG International US, my apologies. And I want to say this is the first in our series of monthly webinars where we are going to explore IT Asset Management and how the application of a uh, IT Asset Management program can benefit organizations in any number of ways. Uh, we are uh, very proud today to partner with the International Association of IT Asset Managers. Uh, they will be our partners for this entire series. I, ITAM is the world's leading source of expertise on IT asset management and the world's largest membership organization devoted to ITAM. Uh, with me today is Ms. Lynn Weiss. She is Vice President of IA ITAM and she will be on hand to help answer questions and provide a bit of information on her organization. And we're also extremely honored to have as our first guest speaker, Mr. Roger Mallett, Senior Architect and Chief Technologist for Hewlett Packard Enterprise Software. Roger has a wealth of experience in not only IT, but also in IT asset management and consults with customers in Europe, Middle East, and Africa to help them solve very complex IT issues. Uh, we will also have a Q&A at the end and um, a little bit of further information for you um, if you're interested in pursuing it. I'd like to say one thing about the questions. Um, you should see in your GoToWebinar control panel an area where you can input questions. I'm trying to give you the graphic here of how to do that. We will collect these questions and uh, do as many as we can, time allowed. But first let me say, you know, why are, why are we doing this series of webinars? And um, I guess to say it's obvious to state that the world of IT assets, you know, the large, easily identifiable, centralized hardware and software, uh, you know, is pretty much gone. Um, you know, it's there, but it has been augmented by an explosion of powerful mobile devices from laptops to tablets to smartphones. And as we'll discuss in a future webinar by an even larger number of IP addressable devices described as the Internet of Things. But yet most people when you think of IT asset management, they uh, limit their thinking to what's called true up costs or the fees that are paid to large software publishers when their audits show more users using their software than the enterprise is actually paying for. And by no means is this a wrong way to think. Uh, as you can see from the graphic here, about 45% of those customers surveyed paid over $100,000 in trip costs annually. And this is money that is not being invested uh, in generating new business. So if you really look at IT asset management, it affects a lot more than software budgets. Um, it affects uh, cybersecurity, the Internet of Things, the bring your own device movement, data privacy, and the role of software tools. These are some of the areas we'll explore in coming webinars. You can see on this slide a list of the webinars that will be following this one and we'll explore the different facets of IT asset management. Uh, this list is also available on the APMG and the IAI TAM websites. The bottom line is that without a well-conceived and executed IT asset management program, your organization is exposed to unnecessary risk. With that, let me turn control over to Raj Mallet, Senior Architect and Chief Technologist for Hewlett Packard Enterprise Software. As you can see from the brief bio of Roger, he advises customers across Europe, Middle East, and Africa who seek help with complex IT problems. Roger was also one of the first to be awarded the title of the IAI TAM Fellow. And Roger, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Ron. Welcome, everybody. I know that we've got a, a large number of people uh, in, different, in different locations. Uh, my slides aren't turning, Ron. Hang on. Try. Okay, we're, we're good to go now. Thank you. Um, so, really, first of all, what is asset management? I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on this, but the key thing to know is that assets can be anything that a company owns. Uh, they are usually coming under one of, of a couple of areas. One could be because of the financial value, but quite often it's because these assets have strategic or organizational value to the business and to the company. So it stands to reason that it's important to know what you have, where it is, how much it costs, and so on. 
Today we're going to be focusing mainly on IT. And one of the things, of course, about IT is that we look at really the physical assets that we own and we look at really how we have to comply with regulation uh, across the world. There's all sorts of regulations that we have to abide by, of course. And on the governance and compliance side, uh, these are very heavily audited and there are severe penalties uh, in many instances where companies uh, do not um, follow the rules. Of course, piracy is a big problem as far as software asset management is concerned. And as I've tried to put in the fun pictures there, it, people, you don't know who the pirates are. People will borrow software, they'll use software within the business, at home, all sorts of things. And it is important to be able to uh, track and only use what is paid for and utilized. And of course, you need specialist tools and processes to help that process. So really what we're talking about is the key information. I'm not spending a lot of time on this because a lot of people will probably be fully familiar with this. Uh, I want to move on really more to the more significant areas that uh, would be of interest. But these questions are, are questions that need to be answered. And if any company cannot answer these things, then they're really not, uh, not uh, fully managing their assets. And so these are key bits of information that should be managed and maintained. First of all, on the governance and integration, it's really about making sure that everyone understands where assets are, uh, how much they're costing, um, the processes that sit around them, and how utilization of applications, uh, costs, and systems come into being. But why should this be? Primarily because there's a threat of fines uh, and more importantly damage to the reputation of the company if you fail to meet uh, uh, financial or regulatory responsibilities. In other words, really paying for what you have. And if you look back to things like Sarbanes-Oxley in 2002, ultimately uh, the head of a company, typically the CEO, could be imprisoned if they, if they failed to, to meet the requirements uh, set out in the legislation. One of the key things, of course, from an operational and a, a sensible approach, really, is that if you want to be successful in your business, it's important to be able to look at the growth areas and where you can utilize your, your, uh, your, your uh, budgets in the right sort of way. On the left-hand side, the bar shows that on the operational side, operations spend 70% of the budget, whilst there's only 30% left on average in many companies left for anything that might be innovation. Innovation could, of course, be new projects, new ideas, the things that are really going to differentiate one company from another. If we look at the right-hand side, where it's saying 50% operations and 50% innovation, this is really where companies should aim to be. This is where you can reduce your operational costs and instead spend a lot of that money on the innovation side. So in other words, you're, you're having more money to spend on your projects and differentiating between companies. So it's where people should be aiming to be. And the higher the innovation space, the better in many respects. But in many terms, although finance and costs are very, very important, it's actually the risk side that senior management are usually worried about. So risk is the area that people are primarily worried about. I'm going to move on to that as we move through the presentation. There's a few areas you, you, you might be uh, interested in. The market is shifting. Um, I was in Africa a few weeks ago and they were saying to me that their market is quite different from the most of, of, of Europe and of the US. They've really moved from uh, sort of almost no internet really use to, um, to moving to mobile devices. So people have moved, moved to smartphones and really missed out on the laptop uh, area. Uh, in, if you talk about the average person in the street. 
But they're seeing now today a huge, huge shift to mobile device uh, adoption, partly because of the cost, partly because the networks are there, and partly because people want it. We're also seeing uh, within HP Enterprise um, a big increase in the number of customers coming through who are saying we want to manage our business using our smartphones and our mobile devices. Uh, just because you might be sitting in uh, an airport lounge or a train station or in another part of the country or another part of the world, it shouldn't mean that you can't be in touch with, if not manage, areas of your business that you're responsible for. So that's enabled uh, in most instances and it is important moving forward. We're also looking at the way that the world is changing and I think everybody accepts that the speed of change has increased dramatically and this has a number of reasons behind it which I'm not going to spend any real time on today but there is a need to move faster. Uh, if, if I talk to customer, maybe customers maybe five years ago they would say, oh, we can't use cloud, it, we don't, don't trust it, it's not safe. Today, everybody's using it and wants to use it more. But, of course, we have to make sure that the, uh, the protections around security are there as well. And, of course, social networking, social media has also today become a business uh, tool, not just for, for people that want to keep in touch with friends. And... This is becoming um, an increasingly useful part of, of the work environment. In terms of asset management, um, you need to look at a number of things. It's always going to be people, processes, and tools. And this diagram you can see in front of you shows really how uh, IT asset management covers way beyond what would be uh, normally covered by ITIL, for example because it's really looking at things that are maybe in store, on the shelf, ready for use or finished use, not just the things that are required to keep the live environment running. And this is a question that a lot of people talk to me about and uh, many times I've spent uh, uh, key times with people talking about what is an asset, what do they need to manage and it's really about the companies themselves deciding what is important for their business. And so when we look at the disposal cycle, it's not just a circle, it's really a spiral. Because whatever you buy today, you need to manage through its life cycle, right through the, uh, the ads, moves and changes, through to the disposal side. But then when you get to disposal, you've also got to consider uh, reuse, reallocation, uh, replacement. So that's why it becomes more of a spiral. In terms of uh, asset management uh, within HPE, um, and I know many companies follow a similar path, we look at this in, in the way of how we can share the information. Because the information that we keep on asset management is absolutely crucial to the way that the, the business runs. Uh, making sure that people have the right tools, that they are operational and working, and to make sure that um, throughout the life cycle, the tools are providing the sorts of things that people need to run their business. At the same time, we're seeing an increasing need to uh, utilize um, asset management tools around cloud billing. Do you know what you're paying for? Do you know what you need to pay for? Um, and uh, is it better to know, or would you rather just receive a bill every month and pay it? And of course, the answer is it's useful to know what you should be paying, as with any financial transaction. On the software asset management front, as I mentioned earlier, this is an area of great concern in terms of compliance, entitlement, and really whether you're working within the law or not. So really, we're looking at you know the, the contracts that surround um, assets. We're looking at software asset management. We're looking at procurement and financial management, and we're looking at really configuration management to complete the picture on how we operate. Working, of course, closely with service management, supporting the business as, as we move. 
I mentioned the shift to cloud, and there's some figures here, I won't go through them all, but it, it helps to indicate the speed of transactions, the speed of movement. And if you consider it, today people can deploy uh, a, a product or a service much faster than they used to be able to do. They can also do it from any location, and it takes away a lot of the complexity of integrations that were there before. But of course, as I mentioned before, it's really security that has enabled this to happen today uh, in the successful way that it is and accelerating. So, when we look at um, our businesses, I mentioned earlier, uh, when I talk to CEOs and CIOs, they usually say to me, Roger, you know, yes, of course, finance is important, but actually that's not the most uh, important issue for me. The thing that keeps me awake at night is really the risk. And risk isn't really something that worries you until it actually affects you. When you think about it, if your business falls into disrepute for any reason, this is a very strong reason as to why you might uh, be asked to move on. Uh, and replaced, and therefore it's the one thing that people want to make sure they keep on top of. So how do we help customers uh, reduce that risk? So we need to look at ourselves really. Um, there's an ITAM um, logo there because some of the stuff that is taught through the ITAM programs is very useful in understanding uh, where these things are important and what legislations and regulations are key to, to people's um, interests. And of course, the truth is that it varies. That there is the overall governmental regulations, and these um, are slightly different from Europe to the US, but in fact, they're amazingly similar after a very short period of time because of audit requirements and people seeing these things as, as good things to do, best practice. Uh, there's also the regulations and regulatory requirements that sit around the, the business that you're in. So, for example, energy companies are regulated by the, the watchdogs that look after them. Financial institutions are heavily um, regulated as well, and so on. Pretty well every major area of, uh, of business has its own regulatory areas. So asset management, software asset management, uh, and that the, the financial areas that sits around that actually cross across all of them. Everybody says their business is different, but in truth there are a great number of uh, similarities that need to be um, maintained. So um, it's really about making sure that you look at the things that are important to you or getting help uh, to, to uh, help you understand what things are important and what things need to be done. And of course there's lots of ways and lots of people that, that can help you with that. Having the right tools goes a long way to automating this and providing you with the reports that you need to help you understand where you are today. The diagram you see in front of you is really about governance demands and outpace of IT. So. We can see that the demands on IT on one side are really from the business. There's demands at the bottom uh, line, which is really about control, quality, and agility. And both these elements are important to the success of the business and the company itself. We also can see that um, if you look at these lines on a typical uh, company basis, we can see that an IT gap occurs and where this IT gap occurs, this is an area where uh, governance becomes even more important. You need to be able to look at the controls, make sure that they're doing the right things for the business, looking at reports, and keeping control of everything from ownership of the devices, the cost and replacement of devices, uh, the software that's held on it, and so on. Software asset management. The key really to this is knowing what you've bought, what you own, and where it is. Easier said than done in many instances. It's quite easy if you have one business in one room in one city. If you've got multiple areas of business 
different business uh, units, it may be operating in different cities or countries and so on, uh, the complexity gets harder and harder. And at one time you could buy software uh, by buying a box and a license and you kept that license. Today of course it's not like that. You download the information and you don't really always know how many people have downloaded uh, the software and where it's being used. So you need to be able to track and understand those things. Certainly there's been steps um, over the last few years uh, through things like the ISO standards 19770 with asset tagging and, and so on to help support the process and try to identify a standard way of, uh, of managing software. And most good software tools can read and understand those software tags. But at the same time, there's a lot of software that's written internally. There's a lot of software that's purchased in, in one area but not in others. And it's a very difficult situation to keep that compliant. And the longer you leave it, the worse it gets. And of course, as you can see in Skull and Crossbones, not forgetting the piracy aspect. Uh, which can be damaging to all companies. Then we look at, uh, in a little bit more depth, at the social media facts. Now again, I'm not going to go through all the numbers here, but there's some useful numbers here to give you an extent, really, of the speed on which things are changing. And when we look back maybe in you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, I think today, we will see that there's a, an accelerating speed of change and at the moment we don't see too much about that slowing down. We're seeing a momentum towards uh, the, the application side of the business taking precedence perhaps over the, the hardware side, although of course both need to run in tandem. But when you look at the different social media aspects, whether they're business related uh, um, products or whether they're more social related adapt uh, adaptations and applications, we're also seeing that businesses are using these more and more to help actually sell their business, share information, and really it's speed of information out to the customer. Right, well, screen stopped changing. Maybe it's uh, delayed. Oh, can you change the slide? It's stopped. Yeah. No, I, I yeah. Oh. I think we went I think we went one too far. I mean uh... Okay. 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 Right. Okay. <laughs> okay, right, good, thank you. Um, so we see that um, uh, also that there is a gap between process and reality and, and part of that has to be met by automation and tools because as everybody knows you can have the best processes in the world but when people are working under pressure uh, it's quite often very difficult uh, for things to be done in the right way at the right time and records and information tend to get overlooked so you need some form of automation to be able to control that and manage it. So discovery tools typically would be a very good way of discovering, scanning, feeding in information back, and then you can cross-check between what should have happened uh, with what the actual position what has happened. Internet of Things. Um, certainly within HP Enterprise today, and I know many other companies are seeing the same, we're seeing a huge, a huge shift away from pure business interests and, and what is known today as Internet of Things because really it's covering anything and everything. And I can tell you today that Hewlett Packard's been working with uh, companies around uh, activating um, what we would call white goods. Uh, we've been working around the um, integration of information around cars, transportation. Um, other transport covers trains, aeroplanes, uh, and so on. So really trying to bring the user experience together uh, for beneficial reasons. Uh, things shouldn't necessarily be working in silos and be completely different. 
it should be able to link you as the individual with your entire journey end to end and prepare you whether it's ticketing, uh, whether you've arrived uh, automatically, it can pick up things of course uh, through your mobile phone if it's uh, online and so on. Another area that, uh, that may be of interest to you, we've been working with uh, utility companies recently and uh, one of the big areas of interest at the moment is where you have wind farms and being able to identify which uh, which machines in the wind farms are operating successfully, which ones are, are not working so well, looking at the maintenance aspects and looking at the actual power generated and being able to manage that uh, as a whole for an entire wind farm. And HPE has uh, done a lot of work in that area and I know many companies are talking to us at the moment about what they're doing and this could be around behaviour um, so getting instant feedback through uh, kind of simple um, uh, questions and answers, uh, maybe small uh, ways of finding out how satisfied people are with what's happened. And of course health is a big thing, uh, whether you're in hospitals, in ambulances or just really testing your own uh, knowledge and abilities. Now a lot of this uh, is made possible because of big data. Now big data is a term that's very widely used and really what is it? Big data is really about how you utilize lots of information uh, whether it's within one business or across different businesses and how do you use it smartly really where you can actually capture some real useful information. So. Um, it's the way you transact this information and that one of the areas that I think that should be of great interest to IT asset managers in particular is the direction that maybe asset management might be turning. I've spoken to a number of uh, large corporations um, in the UK uh, and across Europe, Middle East and Africa where they're really talking about asset management taking on new areas because of the skills and the tool sets and the processes that sit around asset management, why not use it in other smart ways? And I'm going to talk about uh, GDPR in a little while, but that's really becoming a huge area of interest. But also um, really looking at how you manage data. So if you think about it, everything is like a lake. It's, uh, we, we tend to acquire more information, we acquire more assets, we acquire more software, but really, do we ever manage that properly? Do we try and reduce the size of the lake to the bit we actually need so that we can manage that in a smarter, more proactive way? Now, this is the same with information, information management. It is very much a strategic asset of the business, and it's becoming more so, as I'll explain as we go through. It's an area where asset management can move to a new level of the organization and where it tends to link quite closely with the areas of risk and trying to reduce those risks and the things I've mentioned already around compliance and control and regulation to be able to uh, put the company in the place that it wants to be. We accept, I think, uh, quite widely that there is an explosion of data and if you look at just some of the figures I mentioned earlier, Data is very often not deleted, it's just added to and added to. But quite often in an organization you might find that there could be 1,000 or 2,000 documents that are absolutely identical which are being held in that data lake. So why not try and move to a situation where you only have one version of that document providing it's, it's the same as the others uh, so that you're not keeping multiple versions of exactly the same thing. That's a very simple way of explaining why uh, there are big data challenges. And of course, once again, um, it's possible to get tools that can help automate and improve this. It helps regulate what you've got. It reduces the size of the information lake that you're holding. And of course, it reduces your storage requirements. So it makes a lot of sense to do that. In the same way, as hardware assets, you know, you really only want to 
utilize and maintain the ones you, you're using and the ones that are on standby that you might need to use for your business. So there are a lot of similarities and the skills on the asset management side and the finance side actually link together very well with these data, information, asset management lakes that I'm talking about. So the challenges are there to be seen. Uh, one of the big things that's coming out, and I, I'm sure many of you will have heard of this, certainly global corporations are extremely worried about this. I'll explain exactly what it is. GDPR is the new regulations that have come out which manage the, uh, it's called General Data Privacy Regulations, but it manages, uh, it, it's really regulating the private data that you have within your company. So it requires companies to know what uh, personal data that they keep, uh, and it's often known as personally identifiable information, PII, uh, and it covers certainly uh, anyone operating within uh, the member states of the European Union, and if you're in the US, don't think you're off the hook, because like Sarbanes-Oxley became more across audit or through audit across the rest of the world, this is something that affects anybody that operates in these uh, countries and therefore many global corporations will need to do this as well regardless of where they are. And let me explain a little bit about what it is. First of all, it came in in May 2016 as a starting point to explain the regulations and how it operates and how it will work across the world. And secondly, um, it, it doesn't come into full uh, being until May 2018. So this legislation, these regulations, are giving companies now the time to get their act in order. It's time to be able to understand what you've got and determine really whether you need to keep uh, personal information or whether it's something that you no longer require. So what it is, and I won't spend too much time on this, uh, but I'm going to speak a little bit on this uh, when I'm in the ITAM conference in Las Vegas in May. Uh, so hopefully uh, some of you will uh, be there and we can talk about it in greater depth. But it's a single set of rules that everyone must abide by. And it's, it's really talking about how you need to become compliant. It requires um, uh, people to be identified to be data protection officers and there is a suggestion that by May 2018 that it may be a, a statutory requirement to have a data protection officer, a PPO. There will be increased responsibilities around security breaches and notifications and damages uh, will be severely uh, dealt with. Um, in fact, one of the key areas uh, that, that companies should be aware of is that you could be charged up to 4% of your, uh, your revenue for that year, each year as necessary, uh, by, uh, because of defaulting against the regulations. So this could end up costing millions if you don't do what you're supposed to do. So you have to identify what uh, private data you've got, you have to show how you're managing it uh, and how that it is, it is secure. Um, there's some guidance here uh, and of course you can have copies of, of this deck which will go into more detail. But um, there are uh, lots of people to be appointed and many people say who would be the ideal person? And two immediate people come to, to thought. But one is uh, people on the security side and one is people from the asset management side. And it's something you might like to get on board for now uh, because it, it is going to become huge. I've been talking to what is commonly known as the, the big five consultancy companies and they all tell me that they're building consultancy teams worldwide around this and they think it will be bigger than year 2K was in, in the year 2000. So huge areas of investment, uh, huge, huge areas of activity across the world has already begun. So really relevant to asset management, we're really looking at, uh, as I mentioned before, it is a, a type of data management. It's 
they're compliant, it's regulatory, it links of course to cyber security because this is one of the areas that everybody is deeply worried about, the information leaking uh, that relates to personal information and of course this will hurt companies even more um, after May 2018 if they fail uh, to, to be compliant. And moving towards the, the back end of my presentation today, we mustn't forget on the asset management evolutionary model that we need to add value as we move forward to become uh, really truly at the top end of the asset management evaluation. So we're looking at you know, chaos moving to reactive, proactive, ser service orientated and, and cloud and finally to value. And people say to me, but how do we get to value? Well, the key thing is to be able to be auditable, to be uh, compliant in terms of all the regulations, but at the same time, be able to report on yourselves, look at what you're doing, look at analysis and, and the way you're operating, and then look at how you can utilize that in other, other ways to improve the, the value of the business. And if we can look at that in a uh, more of a maturity model, we can see that we move from reactive through to predictive. And you can see that uh, there's some suggested ways in which you can uh, help move in that direction. So it's really an upward curve and everyone that thinks, oh well I've, I've put in an asset management tool and we've got some processes so I think we're there. Uh, no, it's not quite like that. We need to be more dynamic, we need to be constantly reviewing and improving what we do and as I've tried to indicate today there are a range of, uh, of, of outside and external activities that we should be aware of like GDPR, like security, uh, like information and data management where we can actually keep on top of this and make sure that we are ahead and let me tell you anyone on the asset management side that takes this forward proactively is usually very highly regarded and usually moves up the organization very quickly. So it's in your personal interests as well as uh, business interests to, to take these things seriously. These are in fact, I would say more than trends today. And my slides aren't moving. Ron, if you can try again for me, unless it's just delayed. Okay, one more please. Okay, so uh, I mentioned mobility right at the beginning and we mustn't underestimate this. Um, we're seeing smartphones today doing what um, quite heavy duty PCs did at one time of course. And we're seeing people operate uh, in pretty well everything they do. Uh, uh, um, uh, my children go out and I say where are you going and they say uh, don't know yet dad, we'll find out when we're on our way, someone will send us a text message to say the best place to go to, uh, where is offering better uh, deals to meet up and so on. And uh, of course we're seeing a lot of things today where you can walk into a store, it picks up your, your mobile uh, connection and offers you immediate deals uh, nearby to where you're standing. And of course this is the same in terms of business applications where we can actually utilize the smart way of operating, the smart way of networking to improve the way that we, we build and, dis, uh, and discover and deliver our business applications moving forward. And it doesn't just mean, mean to be local, it can mean uh, far afield as well. So again, uh, an area that we need to maintain and keep on, on top of. Okay. So in summary really best practices, I, I won't go through all these because of time, I promised I would finish on the dot of my, my slot, but really uh, the key thing to remember is we need to be agile ourselves in the way that we operate and we look at the things that are happening around us. Don't be focused purely on the, the uh, traditional forms of, of uh, IT and information and hardware and software you need to be more agile and be looking at what's coming and prepare yourself for that. It's easier to get ready now for it than uh, be hit with it later and have difficulty in managing it. 
And also remember, success relates to people, processes, and technology. And uh, neither one uh, is, is more important, really, than any other. And uh, you can argue this backwards and forwards, but you need to have a good way of, of operating and automating what you do and tracking that, that the processes are working properly. And you need to have smart people who know what they're doing and understand what those regulations and uh, legal requirements are uh, to be able to maintain a low level of risk and reduce risk to the business. The GDPR, if you haven't heard about it, you will. And that completes my uh, presentation on time, Ron. And um, I'll pass back to you, Adeline. Yeah, you did great, Roger. Thank you. And um, uh, it's a, like I guess it's a brave man who puts his phone number up on a webinar. But uh, thank you very much for sharing all of that knowledge with us. And uh, I'd now like to bring on Lynn Weiss from uh, the ITAM organization, just to say a few words about uh, about ITAM and some of the resources that are available for those people who want to pursue uh, any of this IT asset management information in more depth. So, Lynn, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Ron. Uh, thanks for, for putting this together. And Roger, of course, for illustrating some of the key issues that that IT asset management organizations deal with every day. And in response to that, over the past 15 years, we at the ITAM organization have worked with both practitioners as well as industry experts to build a foundation of education and networking while stressing the benefits and value that are from controlling the financial, the risk, as risk aspects, and adding efficiencies into an organization while using their IT assets. And these are the things that make a difference to organizations, being able to show that value that the IT assets bring to the organization all the while you're controlling the environment. So obviously, how have we done this? We've done it through a series of educational classes, some of which deal primarily with the tactical aspects of software, hardware, mobile, and disposition management. And coming next month, our newly formulated uh, liaison to security asset management uh, program as well as the overriding strategic view of an ITAM program, which is our CITAM program. Uh, these help to uh, develop the practitioner as well as all industry experts in understanding not only the value that asset management brings to the organization, but where it fits within the organization and what it should be working with and how it adds that value to the rest of the organization. Next slide, please. I went too far. There you go. <laughs> so in addition to, to the education classes, some of the things that we've determined over the years was that we need to bring ITAM out to the public and we need to encourage uh, sessions and events where networking is capable for everyone, whether they're a practitioner or whether they are an industry expert or a vendor providing products or services to the industry. We need to bring those groups all together, not only to uh, get more information out there, but to prove to people that, yes, you're on the right track and meet with their peers and discuss ways in which they can improve their programs. So some of the events that we have put together, uh, the first one coming up is in May, as Roger said, he will be speaking at our annual conference outside of Las Vegas in Henderson, Nevada at the M Resort. And it is three days dedicated to best practices in IT asset management, talking about uh, issues of how are assets acquired all the way through the disposal aspects of asset management because that's what we do. We bring the entire life cycle and knowledge of that life cycle to you. Followed that uh, in the fall, we're going to have an annual conference in Rome, Italy for those people that are overseas as well as in October in Tokyo, Japan. And 
in the middle of all this, we are going to have a series of road shows, a series of one-day events where it is stressed for networking. We're going to talk about a series of best practice topics and then end the sessions with um, multi-topic uh, um, networking sessions where everyone in the event can talk over the key issues of the day. And those are going to be, as you can see, our road shows in Brussels, Paris, London, and Rome. And then in the fall, we will probably come back to the U.S. So if anyone, like Ron says and Roger said, is interested in any of these uh, items, in taking any education, or attending any of our, result, our uh, events, they can look at the ITAM website or just give us a call at the office. Ron, I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Thank you, Lynn. And, uh, and I do encourage everybody to look into the ITAM organization and some of these events. Uh, you will get a chance to meet with some experts in the field and kind of share your experiences with other people who are going through the same thing. So um, I do encourage that. Um, before we move to questions, I'd also like to kind of mention three of our accredited training organizations who gave us uh, quite a bit of help in promoting this today. Um, First one is uh, two in the U.S. actually, the Intelligence Consulting Enterprise Solutions Organization, as well as LearnQuest, and then from Canada, Technology Asset Management. So my thanks to these three organizations for all of the help they gave us in organizing and promoting the webinar. So with that, let's. Uh, I know we're at the 45-minute mark, but I think we have time for a couple of questions. So Roger, I think you know I'll address these to you. And the first one is, uh, which I think is a very good one, is. Uh, what do you see as the biggest obstacle to ITAM adoption by companies? Um, I think there needs to be a willingness at the top end um, to start with because otherwise you don't get budget, you don't get support. Um, and this is really usually quite easily uh, managed through uh, building a business case and explaining what happens if you don't do things. I think that uh, the uh, the damage to reputation is is one of the biggest uh, concerns for people and when you look at the obstacles I think these really sit around well how do you actually find things uh, so for instance it's one thing to be able to find things which are physical that you can find and see and touch but when you're talking about downloaded software it's another another area altogether so the SAM area in particular tends to be the more difficult uh, area, of course. And then added to these other things I mentioned, GDPR, um, the, the, the growth of um, uh, other areas of activity around information and data management, uh, plus security, are all, uh, all have their own obstacles in, in their own way, but can be overcome, of course. Great, thank you. And, um, you know, the next question, is um, from your experience on a scale of one to five, what is the average maturity of companies' ITAM program? And I, I mean, I'll preface that by saying that one of the uh, ITAM people said to me, "If you have IT assets, you have an ITAM program," but uh, that may not necessarily be an actual program. So, what would you say is the average maturity of a uh, company's IT asset management programs? Uh, this is very difficult because you're you're talking in general terms about a vast array of people. I tend to find that the largest corporations tend to be something somewhere I would say around three and a half uh, out of five. Um, I would say smaller, small to medium companies uh, uh, on the sort of maturity scales that I showed during my presentation would be slightly lower than that. Um, so they'd probably come out about uh, two and a half. So most people go beyond the chaos and think they have an understanding of what they've got, but quite often they're not much more than spreadsheets, maybe Excel spreadsheets or something like that, and really have no depth of knowledge and not really tracking information. And it's really around the software asset management that I think they need to do a lot more work. Uh, and that's obviously an area which, which uh, needs to be addressed. Great. Well, thank you very much. And I, I see we are pushing up against our time window here, so that will be, I guess, the last question that we will be able to entertain. 
So before we sign off, I would like to thank once again uh, Roger for a very uh, informative presentation and also Lynn for adding the information about her organization. It, again, I encourage everybody to look into that. And I would like to thank everybody who uh, took the time out of their schedule to uh, be with us today. And I uh, would just say I look forward to March 15th where we will be doing our next webinar on IT asset management and cybersecurity. So with that, I will uh, wish everybody a very good day and thank you once again. Thank you.